A while ago, I hacked into one of the biggest retailer in the US and they do some work in Europe as well, but I've been having a hard time with creating the ride hub and the CTF level for it for you guys to follow along for two reasons. One, because it includes virtual hosts and I feel like I should cover that. So this is the reason why I'm making this video. And two, it's a little bit more complicated and involves uh, virtual host scanning, a few SSRFs, but let me know down in the comments if that's something you want me to work on. Maybe it's not necessary, but uh, let me know what you think. You want me to make that video, comment down below and let me know. It is one of my favorite vulnerabilities because if it wasn't for scanning for virtual hosts, I would have missed out on two credit calls at a maximum payout on this bug bounty program. And honestly, that would have sucked. And the more and more I've thought about it, I don't think it's exactly ready for a bug bounty stories episode, which I promise I'm gonna make more of those. But I just wanna kind of talk about what virtual hosts are before we get into the examples that I have of virtual host scanning and vulnerabilities that I've found so far. For this video, I'm gonna explain how it works. All you gotta do is go to hackinghub.io. I'll link it down below. And you gotta go to the hub called Virtual Host Basics, launch it and follow along. And we're gonna talk about all these different methods and ways you can look for it. Okay, now that we have launched the hub, the first thing we gotta talk about is how does a virtual host work and how do we really look for it? So a lot of times what you can do is you can go to your terminal and just type in something like host or even just ping and see what IP address it returns. Well, sometimes it could be behind a WAF or sometimes it may not be. But when you get the IP address and if you have the same IP address for two different hosts, then obviously there could be a virtual host both hosted on the same machine. And the way it works and the easiest way to explain this is when you make a request to a web server or a server in general, the, your browser is going to say, hey, uh, this is the IP address I'm requesting this information from. Do you have a matching host with this host name? And if you do, can you return the contents of that web page to me? And that's easy to confirm also as well. All you have to do is do a curl uh, to the IP address and you can actually set the host manually for whatever host name you want to send to it. So you can do host and send that request and you can see it comes back with some data. And obviously if we go to that same page, www right here, you can see that it's returning the same content, which kind of shows us that setting that virtual host worked. Obviously you can also set some invalid characters. It may not give you the same. And you can see it for this one, it says an Nginx. So maybe it doesn't work. And obviously the other thing that you can do is just go to the IP address on its own. So it's gonna go up here, copy it and tap into our browser and just see what it returns. And you can see the Nginx page is different than what we would see as the host itself. So those are the two ways of kind of looking at if it's a virtual host or not. And obviously there is a favorite of just putting local host on there to see what it returns. But putting these different values inside of the host header is a really good place to look and see if your hosts are alive, which we'll talk about different methods of scanning for it later in the video. But just manually doing these curl requests, setting a host header is just a really good place to look for anomalies. So for example, right here, when I pass the local host as the host header, it is going to give us another response, which kind of shows you that it's actually hosting and serving different content for local hosts, the IP address, and if you actually passed the right host name that exists on that machine to that server. So keep that in mind. You want to kind of look for different behaviors of what happened if you give it an invalid host, a local host, or even a valid host that you have. But the question becomes, how do we actually find these hosts? Well, that's a complex, but yet kind of easy solution because it all comes down to your asset discovery or your recon process, because the data that you get from that is subdomains that you get from that could be served as a part of this process. So what I mean by that is if you get a list of subdomains using subfinder and it returns a bunch of different DNS records, some of these DNS records may not be accessible, which is a really good place to actually try as a virtual host on some of these IP addresses that you don't have a host for. So for the example of the retailer that I talked about earlier, the, the whole thing was that I had an IP address. It said something like helpdesk.site.com, but helpdesk wouldn't work but I ended up just feeding it a list of all the domains that I had that I couldn't access because it was a dead DNS record or something like that. And I passed it as a virtual host and eventually came back with a 302 that was actually redirecting me to something else that was vulnerable to an SSRF. So keep that in mind. You wanna look for those things, but let me show you what those look like really quickly. What we're gonna do is in this example is we're just going to look for a list of virtual hosts using Burp Suite. What we're gonna do here is quickly, we're gonna activate our proxy. We're going to send this request to Burp Suite. We're going to intercept it. 
And you can do this with Burp Suite. It's one of the easier ways to do it. You want to disable this box when it says update host header to match target because we don't want it to match this every time we send a request to this box. So we're going to unmatch this. We're going to actually put our entry point right here. Let's do this one more time. And then we're going to go to our payloads. We're going to do a simple list. For the sake of this video, I'm not going to import a list of domains or DNS records and do a large word list. I recommend doing that. But what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to simply just add a few words. I uh, saw Zeus was in there because I know it exists already because I created this with Adam. So I know what exists. But we're going to put app dev, uh, API. Uh, let's do something like app API, add admin. We're going to do stores, store, uh, admin. And we're just going to launch this attack and see what comes back because I want to show you what behavior you should look for when it comes down to launching this intruder on a uh, burp suite and you can see right here our first valid request was to www which has the length of 2448 we're just gonna sort this by length the next one is app dev and we can actually go to response i'm actually going to see if i can render this here really quickly and we can see this is coming back with a render it's a development login and if we go to z for example it's the nginx so probably it doesn't exist and all the way down here to our zeus that says evil cult api server and it says for customer data, use host, which indicates there is a different behavior and different content that it's serving for us. So that's all great. This is more of a brute force attack. But what if you don't want to brute force? What if you have a list of domains? Maybe you use Subfinder, you use cert.sh, and this company doesn't have just trade up names like API, app, app.dev, and you just want to use a list of domains that are more complex that have already created based on your asset discovery process. What we can do right here is we're going to quickly go to our FF and we're going to just give it the dash H to set a host header or any custom headers. We're going to use dash W. This is your word list. We're going to give it host.txt, which is a bunch of domains like app.site.com. These are actually host names and not just words that I've already collected. And obviously the dash U is the IP address we want to send this request to. And let me just show you quickly what host.txt looks like. And we're going to actually add localhost to it. But let's just say hypothetically, this is the data that I've gotten from a third party tool like Subfinder, cert.sh, or any of your other ones. What we're going to do is we're going to launch this really quickly. And we're going to see what the result looks like. And as you can see, same thing, very similar to Burp Suite. Now we have the same kind of data, which shows us right here that uh, this one, for example, Zeus exists, but there's also something like app dev that also exists. So that's cool. You can do both ways. I like to use FF because Burp Suite seems to be buggy sometimes and it just takes too much resources. And I don't want to use my personal computer. You can use something like FF from a VPS or a virtual private server. If you don't have one, I will leave a link down below for $100 of free digital ocean credit. You can use it on me. The first sign up is on me. It's free. You can use it for its purposes. So we have done the two of these, but now how do we look for content on these sites? I've identified a virtual host. I found some weird behavior on a host, giving it a virtual host with the IP address. But now what do we do next? Well, that's easy. What we're going to do here is we're going to take, for example, this case, when we go to Zeus, we're going to put Zeus in here and you can see it says, hey, I can't open this. Well, there is a trick to this. If you can't open up a host, you don't have to always do a curl. What you can do is you can go into your machine and this is your actual machine, not your uh, VPS. On my host machine that I have right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to add a host with the right IP address. So this is the host that I want. I'm just going to quickly back out, do a ping, get the IP. Let's do a, actually one more time. This is the IP address of the host. We're going to do a nano of our ETC host. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, I want you to open up Zeus and pass it to this IP address every time I type it into my browser. So if we go right here and type in HTTP Zeus, it's going to actually open up because we have defined it as a virtual host and a host in our ETC host file. So that's the trick to do it. If you don't want to always use burp or you don't want to just do a curl, you can set this up in your ETC host and bring that out and check it out. But there's one more thing here. And as you can see right now, there is more to this that it says, hey, for customer data, use host. So let's look at it one more time. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to go to our payload right here. And we're going to add Zeus to our 
host that we want to attack. So let's create another one right here. And we're gonna say Zeus, we're gonna start our attack. We just gotta go back and close this up. And we're gonna go to our payloads and we're going to type store stores API app dev API dev API dev. Okay, and let's launch this one more time. We're gonna say ignore. Maybe I should go in here. Let's see one more time. Let's ignore it. And now we can see the same behavior, but this time what really matters is not really the content length, but we want to look for right here as a status code. Sometimes you may not get a 200, you may get a 404, you may get a 401, but I really want to highlight the fact of like not only looking at the length, but also looking at other behaviors like the title, the status code, and anything that could be abnormal or not just normal behavior of when you interact with this application. So in this case, if we go to our store, let's look at the response really quickly. Let's send it to repeater, go here, and we're gonna send this request. You can see it comes back and it says, hey, I have a customer API in this case. And now what's really cool is we can actually do some content discovery. And this is what I mean by when I was hacking on this large retailer, if I didn't have this virtual host attached to FBUF, I couldn't have discovered the endpoint that had this critical vulnerability in it. So in this case, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly just say, hey, I want you to do an FFUF. We already have the host header. We don't have to look for it anymore. We want to go after store.zeus.thisdomain. Then we're going to give it a word list. Again, if you want to download your own, you can go to Cyclist or something like uh, Asset Notes website. They have some really good ones. I highly recommend as a base. And then this time we're going to say, hey, I want you to fuzz for an endpoint here. And it's going to start doing things. And as you can see, it's coming back with API. So if we go back here and send a request to API, it may have some data for us, which is going to give us another flag. This is because it's a CTF, but then we can start doing stuff like fuzzing the API and looking from our data and see if it comes back with anything that we can find. I really kind of wanted to highlight what are virtual hosts? How do we look for them? What are the easy ways to look for them? And also like, what's next? We identify a virtual host. What do we do? All right, that's it. Let me know down below in the comments, what do you think of this video? Is this helpful? Are you going to want to see more videos like this? And if you haven't already, do me a favor, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button and become a Naomi. We're almost at 100,000 subscribers on this channel and I cannot wait to celebrate that with all of you. All right, peace. I'll see you all in the next video.